let's take our Bibles and turn to 2 Kings chapter 8. 2 Kings chapter 8. And we want to read some verses here together. Sorry, 2 Kings chapter 2. Sorry, 2 Kings chapter 2. Uh, and we're reading from verse number 11. Verse number 11. It came to pass... As they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them into Pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho, saw him. They said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. And they said unto him, Behold now, there be with thy servants fifty strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master. Lest peradventure the spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, Ye shall not send. And when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. They sent therefore 50 men and they sought three days, but found him not. And when they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, did I not say unto you, go not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word. We pray, Lord, just now that the spirit of God will write upon our hearts. Open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of thy law. Teach us, we pray. Take our minds away from the distractions that would cause us, Lord, to look to other things and help us to be focused on the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Empty me of self and sin and fill me with thy spirit. Give me help to deliver the word of God to the glory of thy precious and holy name. Amen and amen. In our message last week, we saw the final hours of Elijah's life. And we were reminded that, that Elijah asked Elisha what he could do for him before he was taken away. And Elisha asked for a double portion of his spirit, the inheritance of the firstborn, that he might be able to fulfill the role that he had been called to. And we remember what Elijah said in verse number 10. If thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. And we were reminded that Elisha had to keep his eyes upon his master that he might receive the blessing. We learned that last week. I wonder since last week, have your eyes been upon the Savior? Have you spent this week looking to him for blessing, for help that you need to fulfill the calling in your life as a Christian? Maybe as a Sunday school teacher, maybe as an elder, maybe as a committee man, as a church member, as a husband, as a wife, as a child, as a parent. Have you asked and looked upon the Lord for the help that you need? Well, Elijah has left the earth. The Bible says he was taken up by a whirlwind into heaven. But Elisha is left. You see, there's still a work for Elisha to do. There is still a work for him to do. God had a purpose for keeping him there. And God has a purpose for you being here today. God has a purpose for every single person upon this earth that has breath within their lungs. And whenever your purpose is fulfilled, when your work is done, then you will be called home. And whenever my work is done and my purpose is fulfilled, I will be called home. Yes, there are those who have gone before us. And yes, we miss them. But if you're here upon this earth as a child of God, then there's a work for you to do. I want you to notice some things with me from this passage today. Firstly, I want you to note Elisha's grief at the home call 
of a godly friend. Verse number 12. And Elisha saw it and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and he rent them in two pieces. We see here the friendship or the relationship that had developed over the time that Elijah had been instructing Elisha. He had been his teacher, his encourager. There was a great bond had developed here as they lived together, as they walked together, as Elijah had instructed Elisha, his young friend, in the work that God had called him to. There was a very precious friendship that had developed. We see that from the language that is used here. And you know, there are those that God allows into our lives that are very special in our walk with God. Those who encourage us as Christians. Those who help us to go on with the Lord. And if there are those in your life, and I would suggest everybody has someone who's an encouragement to them. If there are those in your life who encourage you as a Christian, thank God for them. Pray for them. And encourage them. You know, sometimes we wait too long to say thank you and then there's no further opportunity to do so. If you have someone who's a blessing in your life today, take time just simply to say thank you. Thank you for being a blessing in my life. Protect such edifying friendships. Protect friends that will encourage you to read and to pray, that will talk about the things of God. They are a blessing from the Lord. And may God give us many friends to encourage us in spiritual ways. But not only do we see the friendship here that had developed, we see an awareness by Elisha that there was a spiritual battle going on in Israel and how God uses spiritual people to fight this battle. Look at what he said there in verse number 12. My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Now, this is a very important thing that was said. I want you to keep your hand there and turn with me to Exodus chapter 14, because horsemen and chariots and horses and all of those things feature in the word of God. Exodus chapter 14, verse number 23. And the children of Israel have just started to go through the Red Sea. And in verse number 23, we read these words. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. So here was the enemy of the people of God running after them. Now we know what happened. As soon as the children of Israel were out of the Red Sea, God uh, allowed the waters to flow freely again. And the people, the horsemen, the chariots, etc., all of those were drowned in the depths of the Red Sea. If you look there at verse number 28, and the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came in after them, there remained not so much as one of them. Go down to chapter 15, verse number three. This is the song of Moses and Israel. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast down into the sea. His chosen captains also were drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. So we see here throughout this uh, book of Exodus and these few verses that we've looked at Exodus that the horsemen and the chariots and the horses were a symbol of the strength of Egypt. Turn with me now to Psalm 20, because the Lord had instruction for his people about their strength. And Israel were not to go in the way of the world, but they were to trust in another way. And in Psalm 20, verse 7, it says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the Lord, the name 
of the Lord our God. One final verse that we'll read, and it's in Isaiah chapter 31. Isaiah chapter 31, verse number one. And it says, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and on horsemen because they are very strong, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. And here we see that the Lord has told Israel, you are a special people. You're a chosen nation and I am going to protect you. And there is a battle to be fought and there is a battle to face. But I don't want you to trust in horses or in chariots or in horsemen or in warriors. I want you to remember me. Because I'll tell you, if the Lord's on your side, you're always in the majority. It doesn't matter should a million be against you. A friend, better to be on the Lord's side and to stand up, stand up for Jesus than to try and run away and try and fight your battles in the limited power of human flesh. The reality is, as Elisha looked upon Elijah, God gave him a revelation that leaving that place and the earth that day was one of the great spiritual chariots in the army of God. One of the great spiritual horsemen in the army of God. He was a great man in the fight, a great man in the battle. And what Elisha was learning as Elijah was taken up to heaven was that the secret of Israel's blessings and success lay not in the physical weapons of war, but in the spiritual army of God. And let me tell you, the success and the blessings of the church of Jesus Christ do not lie in numbers. It does not lie in numbers because you can have great numbers and be weak. It doesn't lie in finances because the bank can be full and the Lord might not be in the midst. Friend, it relies on spiritual people engaged in spiritual battle. And oh, that God's people would remember this. We are in a spiritual battle. We're in a spiritual battle. What do we need in the church today? What do we really need this moment? May 2021. What do we need in Calvary Free Presbyterian Church? We need more prayer. We need more faith. We need more holiness. These are the things that will result in great victories. That's how we'll win the battle. That's how we'll be victorious. Whenever we have prayer, faith, and holiness. And those are things that we need. You know, there are people who sat in this congregation. Some for 10 years. Some for 20 years. Some for 30 years. Some for 40 years. Some for 50 years. And they occupied a place in the prayer meetings. And now they're at home with the Lord. And their seat has been vacated. And we need spiritual people to come in and fill those seats. We need people, as the Lord calls saints home, to come say, I'll stand in the gap. I'll be the prayer warrior I'll be faithful in this congregation. And I encourage you, if you're saved by the grace of God, if you're saved and you're walking with the Lord, I invite you with great delight in my heart because I know you'll receive a true blessing when you come. I invite you to come into the battle. I invite you to clear your schedule on a Tuesday night on a Sunday evening, put on the armor of God, come into the place of battle, and come and fight for the victory. We also see Elisha mourning here because he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. The rent clothes was an outward display of what was happening in his heart. 
And whenever people would have walked by, they would have seen his clothes torn. And they would have known in that society, in that culture, how he was feeling by looking at his clothes. He felt broken inside. He felt torn inside. He felt hurt inside. He realized he would see his friend no more upon this earth. And can I say just a few things about this? First of all, it is natural, right, and proper to mourn. It is natural, right, and proper. But I would even go further than that. It's necessary to mourn. God has given us a wonderful uh, release through tears and through crying and uh, coming before him. And it's good and proper and necessary to mourn. But I would also say this, that there are precious promises for the mourner. There are precious promises in the word of God for the mourner. I'm giving you three verses. You may take a note of them if you wish. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3, it says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Our God. Our God is a God of comfort. A friend today, if in your time of mourning or in your time of need, you need comfort, there's a God who's ready and willing and able to comfort you if you will turn to him. Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Have you a broken heart today? Have you a broken heart, the Lord is nigh. The Lord's near you. Psalm 147 verse 3. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Sometimes in life we're so broken and so hurt that we feel we'll never be able to laugh again or smile again or we'll never be able to face life as we once did. But here's the promise of God. He healeth up the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Praise the Lord for those who die in Christ. There's a great comfort and hope in the knowledge that they are with the Savior. But friend, we still sorrow. We still sorrow. Secondly, we come on to Elijah's first, Elisha's first miracle. Verse 13. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. In verse number 13, as soon as this has happened, he takes up the mantle. And that, of course, was the, the display to all of the office that Elijah held. And he took it up as his own. So he was taking up the office. He was fulfilling the call that God had placed upon his life. And no sooner had he lifted up the mantle and he turns and he walks. What does it say at the end of verse 13? He stood by the bank of the Jordan. There was something right in front of him that was now an obstacle. Something that was a problem. Something that he could not move. Now he'd seen Elijah part the water. Not long ago, Elijah struck the water with his mantle. The water parted. But this wasn't Elijah's problem. This was Elisha's problem. And it was Elisha that was standing here. This was his obstacle. And maybe you've seen people who are great obstacles. And you'd seen people who are great difficulties in their life. But by their faith and their prayer, they made it through the problem. God opened the way. God stepped in. God helped them. And you've seen that and you've heard people testify and talk about how God stepped in to their problems and answered their prayers and made a way through for them. But the reality is you're standing at your problem. It's your obstacle. And you don't know what to do. Well, I want to encourage you today that he's still God. He has not changed. Elijah's God is our God. And Elisha was not the first or the last to stand at Jordan and see the waters parted. Joshua had to cross Jordan and bring the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. There's a lovely hymn and it says, Be of good courage, God said unto Joshua, When o'er the river he pointed the way, Jordan uncrossable, 
Things seemed impossible, but the waters divided as they marched and obeyed. God is the same, and his word is dependable. He'll make a way through the waters for you. Life's situations by him are amendable. Mountains and hills he can part for you too. Got any problems you think, or sorry, got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. He does the things others cannot do. Don't let the devil whisper in your ear, well, that type of faith and that type of prayer and that type of deliverance is only for different people and maybe other people. Friend, God's promises are for you. God's power is for you. God's help is for you today. Whatever your problems are, take them to the Lord in prayer. Remember Dr. Paisley saying one time in a meeting, we were singing the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. He said, never get over the wonderful privilege that you have to take your problems to the Lord in prayer. How often we sing the hymn, what a privilege it is to carry. He said, never get over that. Because we can go today with our problems. God was so merciful. He had allowed the mantle to fall. Elijah didn't need that mantle anymore. He wasn't going to be a prophet in heaven. He wasn't going to be the leader of the sons of the prophets in heaven. He had a robe to wear. My friend, while he had the mantle in his hands for Elisha, that wasn't enough. The mantle wasn't enough. The office wasn't enough. He needed the power of God. He needed the power of God. And he called on the Lord who had met Elijah's need to do the same for him. And the Bible says that he took the mantle of Elijah, verse 14, that fell from him, smoked the water and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither and Elisha went over. And the thought, where is the God of Elijah? Lord, do for me what you did for Elijah. And God did that. You see, God showed that he was with Elisha that day. God proved that Elisha was called into this office to take over from Elijah. And in verse number 15, when the sons of the prophets which were to view at Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. They saw and they understood that Elisha had been appointed and approved by God to stand in the office that Elijah had. Praise the Lord whenever God calls you to a work or calls you to a responsibility or gives you a task to do, he will equip you to do that. He will equip you to do it. I know there are many times we all feel, I certainly feel so unable to do what I ought to do and what I have to do. So many times we feel under pressure. So many times we feel we haven't enough time or we haven't enough wisdom or enough ability to do what we would like to do. But God gives us what we need. And we need to rejoice in that and rejoice that if God calls us to somewhere, he will provide for us in the place that he has called us to. If there's a problem in your life today, get before God. How many hours we worry and fear and fret over things we can't change when there's a God who can speak one word and make the difference. The God has not always promised to remove our problems. God has not always promised to remove our obstacles, but he does promise his presence with us in the midst of the trial and that he will bring us through the trial. And we have to trust and rest in the wisdom and the goodness of God that he knoweth the way that is best. May God give us grace to follow him continually. The third point I want to leave with you today is about the sons of the prophets. And there's a measure of great wisdom here because they recognized that Elisha was their new leader. He was in charge. He was their master. So they come to meet him and they bow themselves to the ground before him. Now, what does it mean when you bow yourself to the ground? You're effectively saying, I submit to your authority. 
or I respect you in a very great and powerful way. And that is what they were doing. So in that instance, I believe there was wisdom and there was maturity as they recognized Elisha to be the successor to Elijah. However, what follows is an act of absolute foolishness. And as I was thinking about that, you know, I think we could say that for every single one of us. There are things in our lives that we do that are very wise. And aspects of our lives that we are wise in the decisions that we make and the way we conduct ourselves. And then is it not true, every single one of us, if we're honest before God, there are other aspects of our life, maybe not big massive ones that other people know about, but there are other parts of our lives that are foolish. The word of God says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. I believe that's something we need to do daily. We do not want to do what these prophets did because they did three foolish things. The first thing was this. They went to search for someone whom they knew was going to be taken away from them. Now, if you look at verse number two, or sorry, verse number three of this chapter, the sons of the prophets that were Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? Verse number five. The sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? They knew he was going to be taken away. However, it says there in verse number 16, Behold now there be with thy servants fifty strong men, let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master, lest peradventure, or perhaps the Spirit of the Lord had taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. You do have to stand back and all sometimes at people's thought processes and wonder where are they coming from? What profit would it be to the work of God, to the people of God, to take a man from this place and take him over there and set him on a mountain? Or put him in a valley. And rather than just heed what God had told them was going to happen, what had been revealed to them, they added a wee bit onto it. They didn't just accept the facts as they were given and by what they had seen with their own eyes. So that was the first act of foolishness, to search for someone whom they knew was going to be taken from them. The second act of foolishness is this that they did not obey God's servant in respect of his office. Because it says at the end of uh, the verse number 16, Elisha said, ye shall not send. And when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. So they kept going on and on and on and on and on and on. Till Elisha said, right, go. You see, Elisha had been appointed by God to be their teacher, a prophet, an instructor to them. They even recognized that. But they thought they knew better than the one that God had appointed to lead them. They thought they knew better. Now, I'm not saying that the elders of any congregation always make the right decisions every single time. But friend, they are appointed by God in the office that they're in. And they need the prayers of God's people. Every minister that stands in the pulpit needs the prayers of the people of God. We stand humbly before you saying we are not perfect, far from it. We know our own failings and our failures, but we're obeying God and the call that he has made upon our lives to stand in this pulpit and to teach his word. And how sad and immature sometimes whenever people think they know better. Now, not to say that we always know everything, but certainly whenever we teach God's word, and it's thus saith the Lord, and then we hear, pile of nonsense. What's he going on about that for? There's no call for that. A friend, accusations being made. We need to honor as the Lord tells us to honor in Scripture. 
to submit ourselves as the Lord calls us to submit in Scripture. And not only did they dishonor him, they disobeyed by their nagging. They nagged him. That's exactly what it was. They went on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And he eventually gave in to prove their folly. And Scripture teaches that we should honor those in authority over us for the sake of the office. The third act of foolishness was this. There was foolishness that they wasted three days, three days in empty pursuit. There were 50 strong men, 50 able-bodied men. And for three days, they were away from their families. They were away from their studies. They were away from their service. They wasted three full days. Now, think about what could have been done if those 50 men for three days committed themselves heartily to the work of God. Think of the number of people could have been reached if they went and sought to win people with the gospel. Think of the meetings they could have held. Think of the outreach they could have conducted. Think of the people they could have impacted. But instead, they left the call and the work of God to go on a silly, empty pursuit. They felt it was important, but you know what? It wasn't. They felt it was worthwhile, but it wasn't. And I think there's a lesson here for all of us that we have to be careful that we don't waste our time. Now, there's nothing wrong with leisure time. There's nothing wrong with rest. We need that for the body and for the soul. We need those things, and Scripture teaches that. We preached on it recently. Come on to me, and I will give thee rest. But there is a problem when people are engaged in things that they think are for the glory of God or they think are for the work of God that are empty pursuits because either they weren't asked to do it, they weren't commanded to do it, there was no leading, but they think this is important, but really it's a waste of time. Let me give you an example. I remember meeting one time with a man in Canada who wanted to meet me for lunch and chat. And he'd come to the church a couple of times, but... He wanted to meet me and we met and that was fine. And we were chatting away and he was telling me a little bit about his background and he was a saved person. And then he started to say about the sermons he was listening to. And this man spent his free time listening to sermons that preached false doctrine. And as he talked, his eyes lit up he was animated. He was excited as if he had stumbled across something great. He goes, oh, it's, oh, you want to hear it? Oh, it was awful. Oh, they were wrong in this and they were wrong in that. Honestly, you know what? I'm going home to listen to it again and I'm going to listen to it and take a notepad and paper and make a wee list of the notes that he was wrong in. And I looked at the man and I said, why don't you listen to a sermon that preaches true doctrine? And he looked at me and he was like, oh, no, but this is good because then I get to learn what's wrong. Do you know how people in a bank are trained to spot counterfeit notes? By handling and studying the genuine article. And then when a counterfeit comes along the way, they spot it a mile off. What a waste of time. What a waste of time. Souls dying and going to hell. Seats empty in prayer meetings. And people spending every waking hour listening to false doctrine because they get a kick out of recognizing it. I rejoice in study and I rejoice whenever God's people personally study the word of God and they have an interest at home and they read. But listen, there's no substitute for the church services and there's no substitute for the prayer meeting no matter how many manuals of theology you're reading God has given us basic instructions and therefore let's not waste our time souls are dying our country is going in the wrong direction and people are engaged in things that are a waste of time We need to pray. 
We need to preach. We need to evangelize. When God reveals something to you in his word, then obey it with all your heart and do it with all your heart. But make sure it's the will of God. Make sure it's the will of God. And Elijah responds with verse number 18. And when they came to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, did I not say unto you, go not? I did smile when I read that because he is effectively saying, I told you so. I told you so. He wasn't polite about it. I told you. There was three days that they regretted. Three days wasted. I wonder, what about this week for you? Was it wasted? Is it regretted? How awful to live a life of regret. How awful to get to the end of your days and have the tears come down your face. Say, I wish I'd given them more. And that's why I say to every Christian, whatever age you are, Obey God now. Serve God now. Work for God now. Give your best to him. Give your best to him. Don't get caught up in things that keep you busy, but really don't count for eternity. Come into the work of God, into the service of God. And may God give us spiritual discernment to do the important things, not to waste time. And Frank, and I just say in closing today, if you're not saved... And I say this lovingly and I say it tenderly. If you're not saved, your life's wasted. All you've lived for, it's a waste. Because you'll leave it behind and your soul will go into eternity. In that place called hell. Wasted years. Wasted years, oh how foolish. As you go on in your sinfulness and fear. Turn around. Turn around. God is calling. He's calling you from a life of wasted years. Don't waste one more minute of your life. But center by your head and come to Christ. Call on him to save you and make you clean in his precious blood. And for those that are his children, pray God will give you grace to serve him until he comes or until he calls. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank thee and we praise thee for the privilege of standing here today to speak thy word. What has been of man, let it fall to the ground and perish. What has been of thee, Lord, applied effectually by thy spirit. O oh Lord, we thank thee. O oh Lord, we praise thee that there's a wonderful God whom we can serve, the God of all comfort, the God of all power, the God who has a plan for our lives. And we pray, Lord, that God's people this day will make sure that they have their priorities right and that they are obeying God in all things. And I pray that even, Lord, should there be one in this gallery not saved, that they will be convicted of the waste of life that they have this time wasted in sin, wasted in shame, and then their soul to be wasted in hell. Oh, Lord, don't allow people to be content in such a life, but call them oh, to true life, eternal life, fullness of life in Christ Jesus. We pray these things for the glory of our Savior. Amen. Amen.